that is from one of your nearby mountains, which has been traded all over by indigenous people for 10,000 years. Okay, that is trade. Yeah. And so you take something that's in one place, Mount Kimio, it's only there, it's a very useful tool, very sharp, naturally comes off in a flip chip, and let's just say you want to trade it with a tribe in Connecticut. Okay, that's trading goods, and you need rules to do that in a more complicated modern society for what the terms trade are. We're not against that. Trade in real stuff, good. Trade rules were just about tariffs and quotas. Tariff is the border tax that's charged when a good comes across the border. Quota is how much of stuff you can trade. And it only covered exchanging goods, actual stuff between countries. And then what are the rules for doing that? The World Trade Organization and the NAFTA exploded the boundaries of what was in a trade agreement. And it added all this other stuff, but they called it trade. So in the WTO and NAFTA is a core rule. It says, all countries, quote, shall ensure the conformity of all of their laws, regulations, and administrative procedures with all of the attached rules in these agreements. That means your domestic laws on non-trade stuff that you would expect to decide democratically in your, in your Congress, in your state legislature, you have to do one size fits all according to the rules in these trade agreements. And what am I talking about? A lot of things are directly affecting Maine. The WTO and NAFTA have rules on things like intellectual property. How long a patent on drugs have to be allowed? Under the WTO, the US was required in 1994 to change the length of our patent terms. We used to only allow a 17-year term of monopoly control of medicines when a big pharmaceutical company had the patent. WTO required we made it 20 years. Three more years of monopoly to jack up the price. University of Minnesota said just for the medicine that was under patent at that point, it cost us an extra $8 billion. Because trade doesn't actually control, as an economics matter, how many jobs are in the economy. It, tr it controls what kinds of jobs. And so we've seen a massive redistribution in our country in the 10 years of NAFTA and WTO. We have lost 3 million manufacturing jobs. Do people understand that's one in six of the manufacturing jobs in our entire country? In 10 years, one in six. As a result, we have shifted from higher wage paying, often benefits providing, often union represented manufacturing jobs, to service sector jobs. And the US Department of Labor show that the average wage cut suffered by a worker going from a manufacturing job lost to trade to a service job is 27%. Over one quarter of their standard of living wiped out. That's happening to millions of people. And I don't need to say it here, because Maine has been in one of the worst clobbered states. And that's just the economic effect. The effect on our sovereignty, our democratic power, has been equally horrific. It's where corporations have used the NAFTA, secret tribunal set up at the, unit, at the United Nations of the World Bank to sue our governments, US, Mexico, and Canada, corporations privately, personally, not going to a US court or Canadian court or Mexican court, going to UN and World Bank tribunals to claim that their new foreign investor rights under NAFTA have been undermined and that they should be paid tax dollars, our money because their new NAFTA rights have been undermined and they're going to a private secret court to get our money. We, on the other hand, we don't have a one-size-fits-all answer. We don't think we're like somehow able to decide what's the best thing for everyone, because obviously, we're the people won for democracy. We believe that the people living with the results should decide what's best for them. And if it doesn't work, they should be able to have the power to change it so they get to choose again what might be better. And we're the folks for diversity, which is to say different things will work for different people in different places at different times. If you look even at the pattern of development and what kind of policies countries have used in different stages of their development, there exists no country in the world that has ever gone from extreme poverty to a level of comfort following the rules of the WTO. Yet of the 160 WTO countries, 100 of them are very poor developing countries. So for them, following these rules guarantees they stay really poor and miserable. 
So for them, the set of rules that they want may be different than what we want. But then number three, we all agree there's a certain floor of human decency. All of those WTO countries are also signatories to the International Labor Organization standards. Everyone agrees what the five core labor standards every worker should have. All of those WTO countries are signatories to the United Nations' two basic human rights treaties. Every single one. Most of the countries in the WTO are signatories on 120 major multilateral environmental agreements. We have global rules everyone's bought into about what the basic level of decency is. Now, we all say it's not good enough, and I don't disagree. It's not good enough, but that's a floor, not a ceiling. That's a floor up to which we all should move and global commerce should be linked. Those three principles, democracy, diversity, and a floor of decency, are what we're for.